on October 31st in Ostend, Belgium. Bernard Westphal, 55 years old, rushes down the sixth flight of stairs from his room to the hotel reception at 10.55 p.m. The two hotel receptionists notice that Bernard Westphal is bleeding from a wound on his wrist. What the man then told them left them in shock. I told the receptionists that I have the feeling that my wife committed suicide. At first they appear to be surprised as today is Halloween. They do not understand. They think I'm joking. Unfortunately, it wasn't a joke. Immediately, the receptionists call 911. A few minutes later, the Aston police, along with an emergency doctor, are entering room 602. On the bathroom floor lies Veronique Piroton, 42 years old, Bernard Westphal's wife. She is on her back, with one arm stuck under her body, lying next to her, a plastic bag. After a few attempts to resuscitate her, the doctor calls the time of death. Right away, Bernard Westphal's testimony is heard. He explains to the investigators that he was napping and discovered the scene upon waking up. In the bathroom, I found my wife lying there with a plastic bag over her head, almost stuck to her right eye. According to Bernard Westfall, it is obvious that his spouse committed suicide. But the emergency doctor on the scene does not agree. When she enters the bathroom, her first impression is death by overdose. The pupils are very dilated. Then she looks for injection marks. She looks on the inside of the elbow, in between the fingers, but doesn't find anything. Right at that moment, she overhears a conversation about a little plastic bag. She starts to doubt and notices a red mark on the carotid. Sur la carotide. Overdose, suicide, murder. The emergency doctor does not yet have enough elements to state the exact cause of death, but instantly knows this death is suspicious, hence refuses to deliver the burial permit. According to the doctor's doubts, the police brings Bernard Westphal back to the Austin police station where he is held in custody. At first, uh, I couldn't believe it because I know that I'm completely innocent here. I find myself in a small cell. I don't understand anything. I am absolutely convinced that this is a judiciary mistake, just a mistake, and they'll realize soon enough that in reality I haven't done anything wrong. Back in the hotel, the investigators search the room looking for any clue. Their first statements establish a very messy room. It is very difficult to distinguish precisely between the possibility of a couple coming back tipsy and not tidying up before going to bed, and the possibility that the room was the theater of extremely violent scenes. Some of the clues found on the scene give credit to the latter. A trace of foundation is found on the leg of a piece of furniture near the bathroom. Several bloodstains are present on the bed. DNA samples are immediately taken in order to determine whose blood this is. In the bathroom, the investigators turn their attention towards the plastic bag found a few inches away from the victim's body. On that plastic bag, mascara traces were found, makeup, as well as saliva. This is not the whole story. Another clue is found near the body, half-emptied boxes of pills, antidepressants, sleeping pills, and anti-anxiety pills. What if Veronique Piraton actually did kill herself? A few hours after the event, Veronique Piraton's sister is informed of her death. It was horrible. I think that my heart is racing just talking about it. 
I was told, I was in my bed, it was 5 a.m. Policemen just came to my house and they told us that she had died. I told myself they got into an argument, they fought. It's a couple's argument that took a wrong turn. It's impossible. I could not imagine the scene. I could not imagine my sister dead. I thought it's a... We are on the Dutch-speaking side, in a little Ostend hotel. And we're talking about someone who is a Walloon representative for a party that doesn't have the majority. Hence, is totally unknown to anybody living in the Flanders. But as an elected representative, Bernard Westphal is covered by parliamentary immunity and as such cannot be arrested like any citizen. To be taken into custody or to possibly be the recipient of an arrest warrant, one would need a completely different set of criteria. Either the parliament can suspend his immunity, but he was a member of two assemblies, the Wallani parliament and the Brussels parliament. So two immunities had to be lifted. Either we'd have to consider we were in the act of a crime or criminal offense, and in that case, only we could proceed and arrest him without lifting his immunity first. In order to justify the fact that a representative was already held for several hours, the judge had no other choice but to consider the case as caught in the act. This is really the moment of the story. I'm sure that this specific mistake to arrest an elected representative is indeed the whole base for the direction of the investigation. Because from this moment on, different actions from the police, from the administration, and from the judiciary will be laid in order to make the story fit the scenario of caught in the act. Bernard Westphal is consequently charged for murder and incarcerated in the Bruges jail. When the French-speaking Belgian media publish the news, it is absolute shock. When we learn of the event, it is utter astonishment. People are in dismay, dumbstruck to discover that this young and pretty woman was murdered. As of course we soon get images in the media. In dismay too because of Bernard Westphal. Even people who do not know or follow political events still know that name. The media frenzy is such that even Sophia, his daughter from a previous marriage, is taken by the storm. On that morning, I got a phone call from my mom. I was about to leave for work, and my mom tells me on the phone, Veronique is dead and your father is in jail. I was devastated and I was angry. I found it outrageous to discover my father's incarceration at the same time as everybody in the media, because this is what happened. Our family discovered the news in the media. I was lucky that I had my mother's phone call, but potentially I could have found out in the paper like the rest of the family. Beyond anger, the shadow of doubt begins to settle in. Can I say that at that moment in time, I was 100% sure that my father is innocent? Let's be honest, no. We never really know what can happen. The investigators now concentrate their focus on the personalities of Bernard Westphal and Veronique Pirotone. They learn that the couple met in a coffee shop in Liege in May 2012, a year and a half before the tragedy. The woman was 40 years old at the time and the mother of Victor, a 12-year-old boy. It's a wonderful spring, a lovely outdoor coffee place, a woman I find gorgeous, even a bit intimidating. I gather up the courage and I go talk to her. She talks to me. It's love at first sight. From that moment on, we did not leave each other's sides. When he talks to me, he says, I'm in love, I'm in love with this woman. She's really a very charismatic woman. And my father was always attracted to charismatic people. Then I met her, and we had a very nice exchange, her and I, because Veronique was a woman who was very rich intellectually. Harmonious, the couple decides to get married three months later. The ceremony begins in a fairy tale in Tuscany, in a house that used to belong to the French singer Leo Fer, whom they both admire. Very quickly, Bernard Westphal sells his house and moves into his wife's home. But the honeymoon won't last very long. Veronique Piroton reproches à Bernard Westphal 
Véronique Pireton blames Bernard Westpal for his financial issues. He's not the wealthy politician he seemed to be. Bernard Westpal took environmental positions, and to support a vegetable co-op, he found himself liable and had to pay from his personal accounts. He is therefore in debt, and Véronique Pireton thought she was getting into a more financially comfortable relationship. I know it was tense between them. She was humiliating him a little bit, and he couldn't stand that, because I think he's someone who was ashamed of the fact that he didn't have a higher education diploma. My sister was using it to humiliate him, and his anger was very triggered by this. In addition to these couple's quarrels, the investigators were about to find out another very dark side to Veronique Periton's personality. Veronique was a contradictory person. She was brilliant, very beautiful and unforgettable. On the other hand, she had that very fragile side of her. I would even say she was battling some demons. Demons born out of the horrors the young woman suffered in her youth. Veronique Periton Véronique Pireton explains that she had been sexually abused by a teacher of religion in her early teenage years. Between the ages 13 and 17, my wife was the victim of the worst sexual abuse. And when I say the worst, I mean the worst. This trauma was deeply destructive. It meant she went through times of great euphoria, but also times of unexplained misery. It is only 2010, three years before her demise, that Véronique Pireton musters the courage to file a claim against her abuser. But the case is closed without further actions. At this moment, Véronique Pireton tries to find comfort in alcohol and antidepressants. The psychiatrist who wrote the report when she filed the complaint for sexual abuse considered that Véronique had a self-destructive personality. He reports that the medication and alcohol are merely a mean of self-destruction, aimed at forgetting that episode in her life, which obviously is resurfacing in her adult life in a very dramatic way. It would seem that, at the time of her death, Véronique Pireton was mentally fragile. And what if Bernard Westphal was telling the truth? What if it was true that his wife committed suicide on the night in Austin? Moreover, while the investigation is ongoing, it came to light that Véronique Pireton had already attempted to take her own life. I was myself personally the witness of five very dramatic suicide attempts. I did not know what to do anymore. I wanted to heal her. I wanted to find a solution. I did not want to let it go. One time, she was walking around, walking along the Meuse River with her mother, and she suddenly jumped in the river. Nobody else was there, and luckily, it's a miracle for her, someone jumped in the Meuse River to rescue her. But according to Veronique's family, this behavior was a call for help, not an actual wish to end her life. In my opinion, Veronique was not suicidal at all. When she jumped in the Moose River, I believe she had a moment of madness, but it was transformed and people said it was a suicide. My sister, she was someone who wanted to enjoy life to the fullest. She made mistakes, but I think everybody can make mistakes. She was always bouncing back and looking to move forward. No, she was not at all a suicidal person. Maybe weak and unstable at certain times of her life, but definitely not suicidal. Facing this complex personality, the investigators will have to analyze each and every clue to shed some light on the dead woman in room 602. Véronique Pireton's family doesn't believe the suicide story. Bernard Westpal's family doesn't believe the murder story. The investigation is trying to establish which version is true. Two days after the tragedy, Véronique Pireton's body is autopsied in Bruges Forensic Institute with the aim to establish the exact cause of death. Alone in his cell, this is a very challenging time for Bernard Westphal. When I arrived at the jail, he was tired, devastated. He said, 
We're going to do an autopsy, and then we'll know more. Then he told me, can you imagine they're going to cut my wife open to see if I killed her? And then he started to cry. At that very moment, I knew my father was innocent. The autopsy starts with an external examination of the body. Right away, the forensic doctor finds suspicious marks, lesions on the face, the hands, and the legs of the victim. The wounds found on the back and on the head could prove she tried to defend herself. Veronique Piraton seems to have been attacked. Was there a fight between the spouses? The mess of the hotel room, as well as the injury on Bernard Westfall's hand, supports this version of the story. Another clue brings the investigators towards this hypothesis. The bloodstains found on the bedsheets. The results of the DNA analysis revealed that the blood belonged to Bernard Westfall and Veronique Piraton. The autopsy brings along more revealing information. Continuing his examination of the body, the forensic doctor discovers deep lesions on her scalp. When we talk about the head, there's a rule that states that if lesions are located above the hat line, if you imagine the head with a hat on, you can quite clearly picture where that line is, then these lesions are caused by direct blows to the head rather than a fall. According to the forensic specialist, these injuries on the top of the scalp confirm the story of an attack. Veronique Piraton was indeed beaten up, but these blows could not have been the reason for her death. While the doctor continues his examination of the body, the absence of deep marks on the neck and throat eliminates strangulation as a cause of death. Nevertheless, some clues do suggest that the victim could have died from suffocation. This absence of air causing her death would have been, according to the doctors, due to strong pressure applied on the nasal wall, to the extent that eight different pieces of teeth were found in the victim's gum. This means that the pressure was applied on the mouth and nose. The forensic doctors confirm this as one of the causes of death. Finally, the examining doctor finds fabric fibers on the face and in the throat of the victim, clues that he immediately sends for analysis. When submitting his report, the expert concludes that a violent death due to asphyxiation was caused by another person. Veronique Piraton's family is in shock, but after having seen the body at the morgue, they weren't surprised by this turn of events. She had her face swollen. We could see the bruises. Her nose was crooked. I thought to myself, yes, she was beaten up. I could not imagine what could have happened exactly, but I understood that there was a fight. For sure, she could not have done all this damage to herself. The story of the suicide does not hold anymore. The investigation's course is now set on violent homicide. For Bernard Westfall and his family and friends, it's absolute dismay. I read this report, you know, from the autopsy, and I'm completely in shock. I am totally traumatized, because when you read such a report, you say to yourself, that's it, it's over. It's a shock, but I had the feeling that we were facing falsification. And me at that point, I was completely convinced of my father's innocence. As soon as the autopsy results are made public, the media lashes out against the assemblyman. It's a terrible blow. In all of Belgium, there wasn't any doubt left. Some journalists and major daily papers of the kingdom used the title, It is murder, in red, with huge letters on the front page. It is murder, no presumption of innocence, no possibility of parole, nothing at all of the sort. The number one suspect, Bernard Westfall, screams his innocence. According to him, his wife had drunk a lot on that day, and the falls she sustained in her inebriated state caused the injuries. I reported myself that she had fallen three times, twice quite badly already, but once very violently on her face and on her nose. Ten days later, the investigators received the results of the toxicological screening performed on the victim. The report corroborates that at the time of her death, Veronique Piritone had a very high blood alcohol level, almost 0.3%.
But there is more. The analysis report also shows traces of six different medications, anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressants, and sleeping pills. The toxicological screening reveals that there is no acute overdose because no drugs were found in the stomach. Therefore, the expert concludes that the ingestion of the medication is relatively old, at least it didn't happen just before the death, or we would have found these molecules in the content of the stomach, which wasn't the case. In other words, the death wasn't caused by medication suicide, neither a deadly alcohol and drugs cocktail. If the investigators think that Bernard Westfall did kill his wife, then what was his motive? It is while digging into Veronique Piraton's private life that an unexpected piece of information came to light. The woman was having an affair. He was a psychologist, believe it or not, specializing in couples' relations. And... It was someone who was proud enough to be able to take Veronique from the hands of a known politician. It was like his 15 minutes of fame. This man, whom we will call Harold, had already been Veronique Piraton's lover in the past, and their relationship had resumed just two months after Veronique's marriage with Bernard Westphal. The journalist Emmanuel Joa had the opportunity to interview this man. Very quickly, he talks to me about this important carnal relationship that they had, and which was a very essential component of the couple's relationship, and that he himself was able to create with Véronique Piroton. I got the impression of a man very much in love with her and very obsessed with her. He also argues that she married her husband out of spite and to make him jealous. A passionate relationship develops with this man, and according to Véronique Piroton's close circle, he exerts on her a strong influence. At times, he insults her, he belittles her, he's really nasty to her, and at the same time, he says that he loves her, that he wants to continue the relationship and so on. So there's a kind of a very ambivalent relationship, love-hate, on both sides, but him, he's a professional. He's a real professional manipulator. By digging into the phone exchanges between the lovers, the investigators found that they never lost contact. In total, no less than 259 messages were exchanged during the two months preceding the tragedy. I clearly see the passion in the things that he wrote to her. I see a very physical passion, a dangerous physical passion, in the sense that he's really obsessive. He wants to possess her. Yes, like all jealous people in passionate relationships. He was actually fixating on the idea that she could be in bed with another man. Indeed, the police find that in his many emails and SMS messages, Harold did not stop to slur his rival Bernard Westfall. A fundamental question now arises. Did Bernard Westfall know that his wife was having an affair? From that moment on, it is clear there's a third character in the story. This lover is the Loch Ness monster of the story. He appears, he disappears, he comes back, he leaves. What exactly did Bernard Westphal know? He probably knew there had been someone. Perhaps there even still is. He knew that she had previous relationships, of course. But in his mind, this whole situation was no longer relevant. In fact, Bernard Westphal discovered the existence of this lover a year before the tragedy. One day, while picking up the mail from the mailbox of their home, he discovers a perfumed letter addressed to his wife. I read this letter, and I found that it's a particularly salacious letter that describes the last sexual encounter that this man seems to have had with her a few weeks ago. At that moment, I tell my wife, listen here, if you confirm these facts, I will be gone by 5 p.m. She gets very angry. She says the man harasses her. 
She tries to call him in front of me and then suggests that I should go and file a complaint for harassment against him at the Liege police station. At that moment, of course, it makes me feel better. And because I love her so much, I want to believe her so badly. But for the relatives of the victim, this version is not in line with the truth. I doubt that it was Véronique Piroton who, of her own accord, had the intent to file a harassment complaint. It would make more sense to think that Bernard Wasfell pushed her to do it in order for her to demonstrate her sincerity. In fact, he is with her at the time the complaint is filed, but he is not present the day on which she comes to withdraw the complaint, saying, listen, I did it to make my husband happy. But truthfully, I never wanted to file any complaint that would be followed up. Of course, she would say that, because she very well knows that this man is not harassing her. The investigation confirms that at the time of her death, Veronique Piritone's love affair with her lover was ongoing. The woman even appeared torn between her two love stories. Basically, I think these are two men fighting over a woman's favors. Like two street cats would fight over a little mouse. One of them destroyed her and the other one killed her because they both wanted to possess her. According to Bernard Westfall, his wife was actually torn between two lives. It is permanently torn between two lives. She gives the both of us completely contradictory speeches. In the morning of her death, she tells me, I love you. I've stopped taking contraceptive. I want a child with you as soon as possible. And she tells her lover the exact opposite, in which she says she wants to repudiate me, that she has managed to drive me out of her house, that she does not love me anymore, and that it's for the best. To try and shed light on the victim's ambiguous behavior, the investigators then requisitioned the CCTV cameras of the hotel where Veronique Piritone was found dead. The couple appears there only a few hours before the tragedy. We realized that the very day of the event, she was going down to the bathroom, then back upstairs and kissing Mr. Westphal on the mouth, and then again downstairs to the bathroom, trying to call or actually talk to her lover. So her behavior really demonstrated a great amount of ambivalence. By questioning her close circle, the investigators discovered that Veronique Piritone had decided to go on her own to a hotel in Aston, 200 kilometers from her home. But what could have been the reason? I think that at the time of the tragedy, Veronique Piraton is a person who is trying to take stock of her life. Because she realizes that her marriage with Bernard Westphal won't continue any longer. And that the toxic relationship that she has with her lover will most likely not have a future either. She had gone to Aston in order to be alone, to be able to rest, so that she could better prepare for a possible divorce. Being prepared for a divorce is what she really wanted to do. Before leaving her home in Liege and heading to Aston, Véronique Piritone left a letter to his 14-year-old son, a letter that seems to support the idea that the couple was on the brink of rupture. During his hearing, Veronique Piritone's lover, Harold, gives the police a major clue, the recording of a phone conversation he had with the victim while she was on the train heading for a stomp. Listening to the recording clearly confirms to the investigators that Veronique Piritone and Bernard Westfall were about to end their relationship. Hier, 
Ok, alors on a parlé. Euh, alors euh, il dit, ben voilà, il faut qu'on se sépare. Je comprends que vous êtes continuer comme ça. Il était tombé d'accord, quoi. Mmh. Alors, il m'a dit, je la fais une milliers, enfin, surtout avec toi, évidemment. Hein. Oui, d'accord. Mais il va louer un autre appart maintenant. J'ai l'impression qu'il n'y a ouais. plus de points de, de retour, de, 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 de machines arrière possible, donc je suis contente. Il est en guerre, mais il va partir parce qu'il est trop humilié. But by listening further to the recording of this conversation, the investigators discover more intriguing words coming from Véronique Piraton. Il a essayé de me jeter sur lui, si tu veux. J'ai bon dit non, oui. Alors il m'a pris par les poignets, mais fort, quoi. Et euh, donc j'espère que je vais avoir des bulles. Et alors bah, j'ai finalement réussi à le faire insulter de tous les... Il m'a dit que c'était un gros sac de patates, une enfin, pute, enfin tout, tout ce que tu peux imaginer. Quoi. Finalement, je suis le mettre dehors oh, parce qu'il a de la force, ça a l'air de rien, il ne faut pas croire. Hein. With this recording, the police are now convinced that Bernard Westfall was a man who could not stand to be left by his wife and that he killed her. If the investigators now know what Veronique Puriton was doing in this hotel in Aston, they still have no idea why her husband joined her. When questioned about this, Bernard Westfall gives his version. I was thinking. I thought to myself, I'll find her. Enjoy this moment, the two of us on the coastline. And when I tell her, I'll come to be with you, she answers me, but why? Because I still want to be with you. Bernard Westphal starts by sending her texts to try to convince her to let him join her. And then he calls her, and he keeps on sending texts. He'll say, yes, I'm coming to see you. Why is he going? I believe he goes with only one thing in mind, to reclaim what is his. One of the witnesses will even say Bernard Westphal is not a man one can just leave. On October 30th, 2013, one day prior to the tragedy, the Belgian politician arrives at 8.30 p.m. in Aston and the couple has dinner in one of the city's restaurants. The next morning, the hotel surveillance camera films their presence in the breakfast hall. Bernard Westphal and Veronique Piraton are kissing each other. Everything seems to be fine. Je l'appelle. I call him and ask him how things are with Véronique. He says, great, it's going well, we're more in love than ever. Véronique is doing pretty well, we are finding ourselves, and I feel really good with everything. And I really feel happy, calm, and fulfilled. I hear Véronique telling him, say hello to Safia for me. Yeah, I felt they were doing really well, and I was happy for them. I was really happy. But something is about to bring trouble to this restored happiness. Happiness. At 3.12 p.m. on the day of the tragedy, Veronique Piraton's lover tries to reach her through the hotel's landline in room 602. I pick up and I hear, here is your big bad wolf, here is your big bad wolf. I said, excuse me. And that was my reaction. I said, in my opinion, it's for you, Veronique. She takes the phone and says, it's really not a good time, and she hangs up. The phone rings again. And I say, excuse me, sir, but I'm Mrs. Piraton's husband. Oh, excuse me, and he hangs up. At this moment, this is it. Veronique is caught red-handed for the first time. Red-handed, right in the middle of a blatant lie. And obviously on that day, everything collapses in her head, as she realizes that now Bernard Westphal has found her out and knows of the existence of a lover as something real. And there, this kind of parallel that she's managed to preserve with two things that never meet, but are not parallel forever, have found a way to cross each other. This is, I think, something that mentally had become too much for her to bear. But the family of Veronique Piraton share this point of view. According to them, Bernard Westfall could not handle the revelation that his wife was still seeing her lover. On that day, the first call was probably unintentional. I'm less sure that the second is so genuine. 
I think he wants to let Bernard Westphal know that he's still in the race. And this event is probably the main trigger for what will follow. For Bernard Westphal, it is, of course, unbearable. He thought he was done with the hard part once he had won Veronique back. But now, the lover appears again. So, it's unbearable. And it cannot keep going like this. Things cannot stay that way. One clue helps support this scenario. The police discovered that 30 minutes later, Bernard Westfall had obtained his rival's phone number from his wife and had sent him an ambiguous text message. Look closely now, loser. For the prosecution, it is an element which accredits that he acted with premeditation and thus this is an assassination, because he somehow announces with this message that something is about to happen. Loser, you will lose the one that you're trying to win back again. Bernard Westphal, on the other hand, had a very different take on the meaning of this message. The truth is, I was planning to go on Monday morning to file a complaint on my own for harassment and to be the plaintiff myself. That is what this message meant, nothing else. Do you think I would write a message like that? Warning everyone that yes, listen everybody, you'll see, I will kill my wife. It's really quite grotesque. It's a way of saying, now you will leave her alone and that's it. This is my wife. She's my wife, not yours. Basically, that's the message, and I find it rather legitimate in this situation. The investigators then decide to interrogate Harold once more. They want to check his schedule on the day of the tragedy, but it turns out that on this weekend, the lover never left Liege. Of course, the police check his cell phone right away and finds that he was not hidden in the closet or under the bed. He was not in room 602 and therefore has nothing to do with the suspicious death of Véronique Piroton. The lover might not be in the hotel room, but he's in everyone's head. He's managed to be in everyone's thoughts with messages, with calls. He is present, psychologically speaking. There were some talks about poisoning in this case. In my opinion, he is the poison. He is the toxic element. He is the person who is trying to break apart the married couple so that no one else would have what he can no longer have. The investigators continue the investigation, especially in order to understand the exact schedule of the victim's last hours. After the tense exchanges with Harold, Bernard Westfall and Veronique Piraton leave their hotel around 5.45 p.m., the husband recounting an evening accompanied with a lot of alcohol. We both had the same things. We had some white wine in a restaurant. When I came out of the bathroom, she's disappeared. I spot her further away entering a Moroccan place. There, we'll drink half a liter of red wine for two, nothing else. We go back to the hotel, and she tells me very clearly that she wants more. Even if she is in a questionable state in regards to alcohol consumption, she wants to have a last drink at the hotel bar. She drinks there two amarettos, and I had a cognac with coffee. Thanks to the CCTV cameras of the hotel, the police discovered that the couple arrived at the hotel bar at 7.45 p.m. We can see that they are people who have partied a little and they drank a bit. One sees her staggering at some moment on the video. He staggers too, but less, indisputably less. They have a drink and kiss each other. Well, all that shows a couple who gets along perfectly well. Nothing at all that suggests that something violent could happen. But one detail intrigues the investigators. At the time of her death, Veronique Piritone has a considerable blood alcohol level, almost three grams of alcohol per liter of blood. However, her husband, who claims to have consumed as much alcohol as she had, is found with a rate lower than one gram. This difference doesn't add up. Did Bernard Westfall intentionally intoxicate his wife before coming back to the hotel? Unfortunately, it turns out that the video surveillance cameras of Ostend are largely defective. More than half of the devices are out of order. 
Perhaps Bernard Westpal wanted to make his wife drink to weaken her. But then we would have to believe that Bernard Westpal knew the locations of all of the police video surveillance cameras, as well as the locations of the defective ones, so that he would only have to pass through places where he couldn't be seen. It's hard to believe. At 8.45 p.m., the couple went back to their room. From that moment on, Bernard Westfall is the only person who knows what really happened. The politician recounts this fatal late evening to the police. Arriving in the room, his wife, under the influence of alcohol, exploded into a violent tirade. She begins by blaming me for a variety of things, professionally, financially, sexually, that I'm not a good lover and so on. After half an hour, she calms down and retreats to the bathroom. I feel that the tone is going down. If you will, the volume lowers. So for me, I decide to take this opportunity to withdraw quietly to the bed, still tiptoeing. After having controlled her once physically because she tried to attack me, I lie down, still in my suit on the left of the bed. Nervously, I fall asleep. Nervously, I really don't want more screaming. Maybe it took me 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'm unable to say. I have no idea. And it's when he wakes up that Bernard Westfall discovers the lifeless body of his wife on the bathroom floor. But for the family of Veronique Piritone, this scenario doesn't make sense. The fact that he took a nap immediately after Véronique Piroton's drunken attack is completely unbelievable. This is one of the weak points of his story. Now, it is someone who has a strong tendency to avoid conflict situations, so it is possible to imagine that he actually lies down and falls asleep. Still, a disturbing clue does not stick with this version. It has to do with Bernard Westfall's phone during the time when the man claims to have slept. Notably, there's an outgoing phone call from his cell phone. At 9.28 p.m., he says he's sleeping and there's an outgoing call. In the chronology, the nap, the rest of Bernard Westphal, this half hour, these 45 minutes, this time is one of the obscure events which we could never clarify. Bernard Westfall has an explanation for his phone's activity at 9.28 p.m. He says this was an automatic callback to his voicemail. For Maître Moreau, the lawyer for the victim's family, all these clues prove that a murder was indeed committed in room 602. The scenario is that there was no scene at all. When they entered the room, Veronique Piraton most likely crashed on the bed. What happened then? Bernard Westphal had understood that the lover was still challenging his relationship and, therefore, he himself was in danger of losing everything again. And this is the reason why he hit her and tried to choke her on the bed with the pillow. At that moment, Véronique Piraton manages to escape his grasp and on all fours hits the closet, which explains the bloodstains on the bottom of the closet. After trying with the pillow, Bernard Westphal will use the plastic bag, probably in addition to the pressure of his left arm on Véronique Piraton's neck, while also straddling her. And there we have it. That is our scenario. Faced with these two drastically opposed versions, the investigators must bring meaning out of the slightest clue to try to reveal the truth. According to the prosecution, Veronique Piritone was suffocated by her husband with a pillow. The textile fibers found on the victim's face and throat seem to support this version. An analysis of these fibers is then ordered to determine their origin, and these results are undisputable. 14 synthetic fibers 
are similar to those of the left pillow. The amount of fibers found leads the experts to say that there had to be a prolonged and intense contact between the pillow and Véronique Piraton's face shortly before her death. Otherwise, the fibers would have been gone. Confronted with these results, Bernard Westphal justifies himself and brings up another explanation. She has fibers on her face, but she spent the night with me. So the hypothesis that was retained is that since we went out, the fibers should have been gone, except that she had put on foundation, which can retain the fibers as well. According to the medical examiner, it is impossible to say if the pillow is the weapon that killed her or not. These elements only show that there was contact with the pillow to which the fibers belonged. But I personally think that it is difficult to be able to interpret this more decisively, given the small amount of fibers that were found, especially in the victim's oral cavity. Another clue is particularly intriguing to the investigators. Could the plastic bag found near the victim's body fit into the scenario of murder by suffocation? The plastic bag is really the last piece of the puzzle. The plastic bag's analysis shows traces of makeup and saliva belonging to the victim, but surprisingly, it showed none of Bernard Westphal's fingerprints. These are non-porous materials that are very efficient in absorbing fingerprints left by an individual. In my opinion, it is almost impossible not to find fingerprints, even if they are only partial. Bernard Westphal's lawyer then brings up another scenario. Véronique Puriton herself would have used the plastic bag. But in these circumstances, we should be able to find her fingerprints on the bag. However, this was not the case. What is sure is that when this plastic bag was on Veronique Piraton's face, she was still alive because the dead do not produce saliva. At the conclusion of the experts' examination of the plastic bag, the investigators find themselves still unable to say what role this clue could have played in the death of Veronique Piraton. The issue is that if you really want to be logical, you have to develop a scenario. Was the pillow used? Was the plastic bag used? Were they both used? And if yes, at what moment? In what way? And when you put all the information together, there was no scenario that allowed you to combine all the elements that we had collected. The clues each have their own specific explanation, but if you bring them all together, they don't allow you to tell a clear story, logical and indisputable. Hence, each element in the story brings its own doubt. Hoping to unravel the mystery of Veronique Piraton's death, the defense attorney asks for a forensic counter-opinion. Dr. Francois Bautier, a medical examiner, is responsible for reviewing the autopsy report. And, according to him, the hypothesis of a murder by asphyxiation isn't that obvious. Here we have lesions inside the mouth, but they can be explained differently. That is to say, the resuscitation attempts could have caused them. In addition, there's evidence here that the lesions were caused by a foreign object placed inside the mouth, in this case, ventilation cannulas, but we do not have any external lesions. It is evident that the firefighter who was the first responder on the scene tried very brutal resuscitation maneuvers. He even signed a hearing report in which he said, I think I broke her rib. So it was very intense and even violent. A toxicological second opinion is also carried out, and its results provoke a real plot twist. They revealed fundamental mistakes in the first report. Firstly, the presence of a powerful sleeping aid in the victim's blood. There's a typo, and not a trivial one. If the correct number and unit are applied, we really are standing here at the threshold of lethal toxicity. Indeed, the first expert noted a rate of 0.10 micrograms per liter of blood, but it was actually 0.10 micrograms per milliliter of blood. The true rate was therefore 1,000 times higher than that recorded in the first report. And this level presents a very significant risk of overdose. 
Moreover, the new expert believes that the first toxicological screening was incomplete. At no time were the consequences of the combination of alcohol and drugs taken into account. It is obviously the analysis of the combination of all these elements that should tell us whether or not it could be lethal. This toxicological second opinion adds further confusion as to the exact causes of death of Veronique Pirotone. In my opinion, the cause of death is indeed related to the intoxication of this alcohol drug cocktail, but it is not for us to determine whether it was voluntary or not. Murder, suicide, or drug overdose, the mystery remains. On October 6, 2016, three years after the tragedy, Bernard Westfall is sent to the criminal court of Mont, charged with murder. After 12 days of court, the verdict is reached. Bernard Westfall is acquitted beyond the benefit of a doubt. It is not synonymous with a victory because it's still a human tragedy. There aren't any losers or winners. But in all configurations, this isn't a victory against a person, but a victory against injustice, that's for sure. I am very happy to be acquitted, but no matter what, doubts will persist. When you've experienced such a drama, it clings to you. When I get up in the morning, I have anxiety, thinking that Veronique is no longer walking this earth. On the other side, Veronique Piritone's family is struggling to accept this verdict. It was like I'd been slapped, stabbed in the heart, really. My sister died twice. At the verdict, I said to myself, but it is not possible. We were at all the sessions, we saw everything, but it isn't possible that people could have doubts. For the benefit of the doubt, it means that the jury could not reach a decision. And for me, this isn't at all satisfactory, because it means that in these conditions, we will never know how she died. 